to introduce uh, Adrian Lane from Securosis. Uh, is going to talk about uh, data breaches and uh, and encryption. And uh, from reading the abstract again uh, in, in the program, just you know the why, when, how, like when should you be using encryption, and, and, and in what ways. And um, again, another another relatively underexplored topic. And uh, a lot of security people will just tell you you know to go overkill and and use it all the time. So I think this should be a, a very interesting perspective on that. Uh, I'll hand it over. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to see me. Um, this is Data Bre Breaches and Encryption. Um, I know the catalog says something a little bit different. I apologize. That was our mistake. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not Rich Mogul. He was uh, supposed to speak here today on, uh, on a different topic. Um, but we had asked the panelists uh, for, the, for the source show, uh, what else did you might want to hear? And overwhelmingly, uh, majority picked, uh, they wanted to hear about data breaches and encryption. So uh, we don't normally give this talk to security experts, and there are a lot of security experts here today. But uh, if there's something in particular you want to get out of this talk today, you know, let me know um, if it's more on the applied side. Um, I will not mention vendors. I don't want to get into the whole which vendor is better or, or, or any of that. Um, but if you have got specific questions, uh, you know, please, by all means, let me know. Um, so I know some of you are looking forward to, uh, to seeing Rich's baby pictures. And we were really trying to find some. <laughs> And so this is the best we can do until he actually makes some. So anyway, sorry for the inside joke to start with. But uh, um, OK. Joke's no longer funny. <laughs> so I wanted to originally uh, do this presentation talking about um, uh, more recent data breaches. Um, and why we're motivated to use encryption to solve some of the problems we have with data breaches. But I realize that, that, that a lot of the people I'm speaking with don't have the same perspective that I do or that Rich and I do. And, and so I, I actually went back in time and I, and I pulled from some of Rich's slide decks and from my slide decks, they're actually kind of old. They're a couple of years old. And I apologize for, the, for, the, for some of the reference material being back from 2000, but I, I think from a a standpoint of understanding the mentality of some of the businesses and why they have not adopted certain technologies, um, I think it's important. Um, so really, uh, the first breach that I was aware of as, as a security professional was the Egghead breach. Um, so you're talking back in, in December of 2000, where Egghead.com, and I'm sure some of you remember that they were, uh, uh, who they were, and a uh, software seller, and they were the first reported breach that I had ever heard of. And very interesting case. Um, that shortly thereafter the breach, uh, they had gone into business. And many companies um, saw this, saw the headlines, and naturally just assumed that when they went out of business several months later, that it, the two were related. Um, that the incidents of the breach had caused uh, a problem with their customer base, had cost them um, investigative costs and legal costs. And, you know, the, the metrics revealed that the company went out of business for normal business reasons. They weren't producing enough revenue to support their model. Um, and they eventually got sold to Amazon, I believe. Um, but from this, the industry learned the wrong lesson. And many of the uh, companies um, uh, learned that, you know, we need to keep quiet about breaches. We don't want to talk about breaches because it could lead to poor results, uh, can destabilize the stock price, and so forth. It was the wrong lesson, but it's what they learned. Um, so, Businesses kept quiet, and what did we see? More and more and more. In many cases, these are very much after the fact. Um, the Axiom breach was a long time before that was actually reported in the public. Um, these are, are all cases prior to California 1386 and other breach notification laws. So what do we get? July 2003, California 1386 comes along. Um, for those who don't know what this is, it's a piece of, uh, it's, it's the California Senate Bill 1386, which requires anyone who does business in California, should they have a data breach, and California residents are part of that breach, that those California customers must be notified. Now, you, there is no penalty if you, if you go ahead and notify, but if you don't, you can, you can face penalties. Um, however, based upon the lessons that they had learned, um, California 1386 in a large part was ignored. And I can say that um, because I'm aware of a number of cases personally 
um, where the companies have decided not to disclose. Um, I've got friends in the financial community where breaches were, were had and they chose not to disclose. Um, I've got friends who used to and currently work for the cyber threat teams uh, for the Secret Service who have disclosed that there have been breaches. They haven't named companies, but they have let me know that there are breaches. Um, I've got a friend in the FBI who is, who's let me know that there have been breaches um, and, and some of the customers of, of companies that I work for. Is anybody in this room, because we do have security professionals in here, is anybody in this room aware of a breach that has not gone public? It has not been disclosed in the press? Only three hands, okay. Usually it's higher than that. Um, but there is a, a, a culture of, of keeping quiet in many cases. And, and one, of the, one of the gray areas that I commonly see is that um, whether it be Secret Service teams might still be conducting investigation, they may be still collecting uh, evidence that they, they intend to admit in court. Um, and they also, the, one of the other gray areas was the encryption. And I don't know how many of you saw uh, Dave Mortman's presentation on this, but one of the questions I asked is, is, is there anything to do with the legislation to change it so that users of encryption actually have to have end-to-end -end encryption, uh, encryption to avoid notification loss many of the companies were not disclosing because at some point in their information life cycle they were encrypting backup tapes um, some of the disk drives or or some of the uh, remote regional servers but not all of the data next in our in our preamble here or, to, or long preamble uh, the choice point and the first major breach um, after 1386 is in full effect so early on unusual activity some 50 small business operators and I call this fortuitous missteps. Um, I had the, <laughs> the, the good fortune to actually be in the office of, of Cheryl Peace, who at the time was the, uh, the cyber threat advisor for the Bush administration. And this was the morning where they had learned it was about a hundred and some odd thousand records. And she was pissed off. And I mean, eye twitching pissed off. And because two days before I was there in her office, the executives from Choice Point had been there and said, don't worry about it. We have it under control. We think it's about 100 to 125 records. It ended up being 125,000 plus records that were breached. And so what in essence happened is there was nobody from the Bush administration who was going to protect this company. They were not going to shield them, that they were going to let them bear the full brunt of this because they felt they had been lied to. So this is one of the very first times I think we got full disclosure because there, you know, we, we really were able to see some of what happened. We got actual numbers of what, what was breached. Um, so what were the losses? Oops. Somewhere around $10 million in, in, in lawsuits. Um, we all know about the FTC settlement um, and some of the other breach remediation costs were associated. In today's terms, this actually looks pretty small. We also learned this was a business process failure, uh, business policy failure, that they, they didn't actually vet the people to their normal business process who had gained access to the information. And I'm sure some of you already know this, but you know, it, it really, once again, we're having a, we have a breach here that it, it's early enough in the cycle that it's really cementing uh, the minds of a lot of people who are going to react to this. Um, we also learned that they had had a prior breach um, technical controls did not eliminate the problem, um, and while the business policy could have been enforced by some of the technical controls, they did not do it at that time. And the other odd thing was is it taught the businesses to react differently. Everybody who was watching this, who had had an internal breach, watched the stock price, watched how they handled it, and realized that the stock price and other sorts of public opinion um, was due to PR and how they appeared to the press and how they appeared to the public just like their stock always is. It was a popularity contest. How do we appear to be reacting to this? Do we have, does it look like we have a plan? Um, and so in, in many cases, um, we didn't see the companies really want to deal with the security problem at hand. Um, but they might deal with some of the business processing issues of it, and they might have a plan in place, but it was more of a PR exercise than a security exercise. Having worked at a financial institution for a number of years as, as a CIO, I can tell you that from that perspective, it's a very different uh, opinion or, or, or approach to solving the problem. 
the businesses suffer from the breaches, and the customer may or may not have some degree of fraud there. Um, and so the businesses that I've worked for, businesses that I've talked to, especially in the financial sector, look at this as a business problem. It's their problem. It's an inside problem, not an external issue. Um, that their stock price benefited and the market in general benefited from their silence. And we've, we're in the business of risk. You know, we loan money. Um, we give insurance policies out. Uh, you know, so we've got fraud built into the model. And as long as we're, you know, at or below our, our expected fraud rates, it's okay. So we'll just handle this as a PR exercise. We'll have a plan. We'll react to it. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to invest in security. I can't, I can't help myself. I was a vendor for four years. Um, this, is my, this is my big number slide. This is my dog and pony slide. Uh, and I, I always deliver this. And, and, and the number um, comes from, from September 15, 2008. It's clearly out of date, um, but it's irrelevant anyways. The number doesn't matter. Um, but I want to show it here because, you know, when I, when I give this presentation to companies, I, I need to do something to shock them into realizing that there is a problem, that the records are being stolen, that there, that there, there is an issue here. Um, but as a security researcher, it means nothing because even though there are 350 million, probably over 400 million now with the various breaches since September uh, 2008, um, it does, it's not an indicator of fraud. It's not an indicator that somebody has taken those records and actually done something with them. That makes the number of records put at risk. Put at risk, exactly. So, not very good ones, uh, which is one of the reoccurring themes of this conference. You'll hear people saying we, we are lacking a lot of the, the metrics that we need. We have about 30 percent in uneven cases. It's another reason why this number is so, is, is so irrelevant is that for half the breaches out there, we don't have numbers. They have never disclosed the number of records that might have been, either because they don't know or they don't want to tell you. Um, so why give you a high, normally high number if, if they don't really know? Um, so they just, they just uh, omit it. And that's you know, one of the areas where we'd really like to see the breach notification laws change so that they have to disclose what it is that they know or at least come out and say, we think it is this. Have some estimate, have some clue. And, you know, find them if they don't because really they should have some sort of clue or, ha or have some investigative process that tells them more or less what happened. Um, so anyway, the, the number is more or less meaningless. Um, that said, um, when, when you're talking about this number of records that have been compromised, um, and, and one of the reasons I didn't actually update the number to be current was is that the very first things I, I remember is, you know, the Heartland payment systems and the Royal Bank of Scotland uh, world pay system breaches. So in Hartford, uh, we don't really know what the number is. Uh, we do know that they have contacted um, some 600 plus uh, financial agencies have recognized some degree of fraud, but we don't know the actual numbers uh, within each one of those agencies. Um, they have alerted 150,000 of, of the merchants, of the 160,000 merchants that they work with, advising them on how to detect and deter um, some of the, the data loss. They have announced that they are going to to perform end-to-end -end encryption, which implies that they are not doing it today. And so this is the sixth largest credit card processing company in the United States. You're talking 100 million credit card transactions a month. And, and, and the number is so staggering that if, if somebody was to be able to get 20, 30, 40 million credit card numbers, um, it, it's, it's, it's a very destabilizing thing to the system itself. Adam Shostak in his presentation had given a challenge to say, uh, can you give me more than the, the known one example of a company failing due to a data breach, you know, the card systems um, uh, example. And, and, I, and you, I can't, I don't know if anybody else in the room can, but I don't think it's the right question. What I really think is the right question, you know, is what does it do to the system itself? If, if I have 50 million credit card numbers and I was really determined, I can take down this system. I could automate shopping, go across 100 different or 1,000 different or 10,000 different merchant sites. I could take a QA system, you know, and, and sit there and, and change the credit card number, name, and address. And I don't care where the merchandise goes, but if I exercise this on, let's say, Black, Black Friday before, you know, the major shopping period during the holidays, and take 50 million credit card numbers and start just pumping them out there, I can overwhelm the fraud departments. 
I can overwhelm the system so where they're going to have to cancel 20, 30, 40 million cards immediately, and they're probably going to have to shut down the system. And you know what that's going to do to commerce in the United States, internet commerce or even uh, in-person commerce, because now the card's not going to be valid anymore. They can't trust it. So to me, it's not necessarily an issue uh, of just this company or that company any longer, that, the, 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 that there's so much low-hanging fruit out there and there's so much information, personally identifiable information, credit card information. And I don't know about you guys, but m one of my credit cards, at least, is also a debit card. I didn't ask for it. It just came that way. So somebody can take that number and then try to, try to go find a, 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 you know, a, a savings account as well. So as I said, meaningless number, but to me, it signifies a lot that what we're seeing, that some of these breaches are now uh, potentially on the same magnitude of all of the breaches that we've seen up until this point. So that's my long preamble. <laughs> Why don't we get into uh, some of the causes of data breaches and let's talk about encryption and how we apply it to the problem. So lost and stolen laptops, still absolutely positively number one. Not sexy, not new, but still this, that is the case. Um, lost and stolen backup tapes, I'm including media and memory sticks in this. Um, Inadvertent disclosure, number three, hacking and compromise. Oh, and by the way, I actually expect this, uh, this list, excuse me, um, probably within the next couple of years to actually reverse. Um, as companies are actually starting to encrypt their laptops. And most of the financial institutions I'm talking to have got the laptops encrypted. Uh, most of the major auditing firms have all their laptops encrypted. You know, so at least 50% of the, of the companies that I'm, I've talked to in, in the last year have this already done or underway. Do you have a question? Um, I think it's going to net the m most records in the future, because I think we're seeing evidence of that with, with the RBS WorldPay incident. And for those of you not familiar, I mean, RBS, uh, they said they lost 1.5 million financial records um, and another 1.1 million in personally identifiable information uh, records, so just personal records. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, that is probably going to be the case. Um, we don't have great statistics, though. I mean, I can't stand by that. I can't give you an example. I can't demonstrate it for you. Uh, it's just purely a hunch on my part. Do you have a sense on the loss of stolen laptops and how many of those are just if somebody sees a laptop on a car and snatches a window? It's, it's almost always. Uh, in fact, you know, when, when laptops first came out, they were being stolen right and left. Nobody thought that the data on the laptop might actually be more valuable than the laptop itself. You know, they were just looking for a couple hundred dollars quick cash. Um, now those things are, you know, people will buy SCSI drives off of eBay to go look to see if there's personally identifiable information. Hey, it's 12 bucks, what the heck? I might get lucky. And they do. I mean, we, we're still seeing cases of this. We are still seeing cases where, where you know, information or, or, or machines just get sold onto eBay and they don't even, they, they're, they're, there's no end point to the information life cycle there. There's no crypto shredding. There's no um, erasure of those disks. And I'll get a little bit more of that into in this presentation. Um, so more examples, uh, not particularly interesting to me, might be to you, you can reference them later. We'll put the, we'll put the slide deck up on the, up on the site. Um, but a lot of people really want to know that there are examples, clear examples out there, uh, specifically to lost and stolen laptops, 85,000, or I'm sorry, 85 million. Um, these are the number of records in the 335 incidences. Um, probably, I believe this one is through December, um, December of, uh, of 2008. High profile example, Veterans Administration. Um, and we bring this one up just simply because it's, it's kind of common um, and it's sad that you know, <laughs> laptop stolen, um, an additional hard, external hard drive was also stolen at the same time. Um, VA blames the employee. Um, Inspector General finds out, well, you know, this is, uh, you know, you, you haven't trained the employees. You haven't provided them with any way to protect this. You demand it as part of their job to have the information. Um, so they mandate that encryption is supposed to be there but they don't do anything about it. They don't give them funding, they don't give them training, they don't tell them which software they should buy, and sure enough, uh, 45 days later, there's another incident. That was actually a burglary from the house, or 
Yes. Well, I mean, it, whether it's, you know, smash and grab out of the back of the car. Um, I, I, there was a ring in San Francisco for a while that was, uh, they had these little Bluetooth locators, and they were just walking through parking lots and shopping malls waiting until they got a hit from Bluetooth, and they figured it was laptop, jacked the trunk, and they, and they were gone. Um, there were a couple hundred cases of that in the Bay Area, actually. So, you, you know, it's not just a U.S. problem, you know, our European friends also uh, have the issue as well. Anyway, not particularly interesting. Um, so data as it moves is not being used. Um, and we don't necessarily need to view it at that point in time. And really, uh, you know, this, is, this is a perfect applica application for encryption. Um, the ability to secure it as it moves from point A to point B, um, or if it is sitting somewhere, once again, it's not data in use. And another point in time where encryption is absolutely positively um, an appropriate technology to, to, to secure data. And so laptops and media get stolen. They're going to continue to get stolen. Um, people are going to forget them. Um, you know I mean, ineptness or clumsiness or, or carelessness are, are going to continually be causes. And it's not something a matter of training. It really is going to help with a lot. Um, so you need to plan on it. This is going to continue to happen. Embrace the fact that it's going to happen. They're going to get stolen. So, um, and there's really not a lot of other options here. Um, your employees are going to use the data. It's part of their job. They need it to, to perform the business function that they are hired to do. And you really don't have another option other than encryption. And you can tell them not to put it on there, but odds are it's going to get there. So the four rules that we have for encryption and securosis, uh, if data moves physically or virtually, um, if any storage for separation of duty, so there are a number of regulatory requirements that require separation of duty for fraud detection as well as for privacy, and then very specific regulatory mandates. Is that rule better or just case-specific? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to go in a little bit more about data in use in a second. Um, but the commingling of information and the ability to, to piece together sensitive information sometimes warrants that, that you, you mandate encryption of all. If I'm going to do a, a mobile disk drive, a, a, a memory stick, um, a, a laptop, encrypt the drive. I mean, now I'm giving you that advice and right here on my laptop. I've got, you know, I've got, you know, folder level encryption, but um, I don't try not to keep anything on the laptop. So. So I actually got my start in encryption. Um, my, my first serious security job was writing encryption code. And um, you know, it, 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 is, it is something that really works. I mean, it, encryption can provide computationally impossible to reverse engineer um, data. I mean, it, it really is effective. Um, provided you've got reasonably good secure key management to go along with it. Um, you know, you need to make sure that they are not writing the passwords on the, on the top of the laptop. Uh, was it keys that had shown me the picture today? Uh, you know, the username and passwords literally printed right on top of the laptop. Um, but encryption is actually not very particularly easy um, to do right. And so uh, this is not something you're going to be doing at home. Um, the, it, encryption does rely on a lot of different factors, like, like trusted pseudo-random number generators to actually give you um, a good randomness in, in the production of, of these encrypted data, uh, data streams or, or, uh, or data storage. How many know, if you know what entropy is? One, two? Oh, okay, okay, good, good. Um, when I got my start, I didn't know a darn thing about entropy. And uh, one of the attacks against uh, the system uh, was to literally feed a series of ones into the, uh, into the entropy stream, which caused the pseudo-random number, number generator to be not very random, and they broke the system I had deployed. So um, I, th these are the elements that must be there uh, to help and make sure that you have good cryptography. However, we have a number of vendors out there who really know how to do this well, um, that have been doing this for a long time, um, have, have the appropriate uh, crypt cryptographers who know how to design algorithms, uh, they have people who are trained in the implementation of those algorithms, and they put together a, a, a well-respected, um, exercised, and analyzed both white box and black box, um, the quality of, of the end results. So we know how to do this. The science is there. The implementations are there. There are a lot of good vendors out there. 
oh yeah, you got to kind of make sure they're not running on compromised platforms either. Uh, so there, there is a reliance on some network security here or uh, platform security. So portable media, um, I've already talked about this. Um, there are also, uh, you can do this for software. Um, there are some vendors I uh, won't mention, but they also put chips in that will go ahead and encrypt memory, uh, uh, the little memory sticks. Um, and there's plenty of the uh, software options for removable media, CD-ROMs that will go ahead and auto-encrypt. Um, it's almost seamless. Whole disk drives, uh, Apple for use or Mac users, you know that they come standard. Um, there are a number of uh, opportunities, uh, or sorry, a number of vendors who provide very good whole drive encryption. And most of the drive vendors now are producing disk drives that are having encryption built in also. So if it is lost or stolen, you don't worry about it showing up on eBay with all your data. On the back end, um, there are other options as well, especially for the enterprise customer. So file and folder level encryption, application and database, um, and once again, all of the same options for media, but uh, for the enterprise space. Now, application and database is a little bit different. Technically, a database is not data at rest. Oops. It is data in quasi-rest. It's used. It generates reports. There are queries constantly run against the database. So there are ways of, of either segregating out data sets, um, moving table spaces, column level encryption um, that do very, very well. Uh, a lot of companies I deal with do not encrypt the database. Uh, the performance impact is, is still at a point where it is not necessarily operationally viable. In some cases it is, in some cases it isn't. But there's almost always some piece of design work on the operation side to change the way things are working to get it to be a, a viable solution. If your business, though, is, you know, transacting credit card numbers, you'd better do it. Um, not just because of PCI, but because somebody will get in there. Somebody will, you know, get, uh, you know, through SQL injection, through access to the platform, or, or just pure stupidity, somehow somebody will get in there. Um, so if, it's your, if that's your business, plan on doing it. But it might take some, um, some severe <laughs> steps to get it to work properly. I typically recommend, now, I typically recommend the database providers, um, most of the platform providers have, have optimized their, their code in such a way that it works pretty darn well. Um, it's effective uh, key management as long as it's external to the database, um, but the encryption algorithms they're using are, are, are solid, they're well, they're well designed, well implemented, um, and they're faster than what I'm finding from, from the other third party vendors. Um, this was not the case two years ago. So obviously encryption is not a panacea. As I had mentioned in the other slide, if the platform's compromised, you can do just about anything. If you own the platform, you're gonna see just about everything. You're gonna see the S boxes when they're, you're gonna find the keys. Um, so there are other things that need to go along with it. Plus it's, certain, it's not good for certain types of problems. Um, so you still need access and authorization. Um, you're still gonna need audit capabilities to make sure that the trans transactions going on in these encrypted channels or with this data are valid. Um, you still need a reliable platform and network. And one of the things I recommend is data validation. Um, how many of you are familiar with immutable logs? Anybody? One person, okay. Uh, then I will explain. So the common protection for, for data at rest is, is encryption because it allows us to both achieve privacy of the data because you can't read it. Uh, but it also gives us a, a degree of reliability or unalterability because if you touch the encryption file, uh, you get garbage out when you try to decrypt it. Um, but once you do decrypt it, it's not necessarily untamperable anymore. You can change values. So Im immutable logs and data validation technologies are such that we are, we are taking the data and, and sometimes it's, it's file by file or, or page by page or, or record by record, but we are creating a, a, a digital hash on that so we can verify that the contents um, have not been changed. Um, we will sign that so we know that the, the hash came from the appropriate authority. We might chain that information so that we, we take sequence information so that this record is now next to this record, which is next to this record, and taking some sequence of information, putting it into that hash and putting it into that signature value so that information cannot be inserted. And we will also timestamp that um, so that it, we know when it was produced, 
Um, and we'll even do something with, with key swapping um, to show that we are the real signing party and somebody didn't you know, take our keys and, and go somewhere else and then recreate this chain. So there are these types of immutable uh, log file and data validation technologies that are very effective when, when trying to produce court admissible evidence. Um, these are handy in e-discovery. They're not a requirement yet. Um, I expect NIST, um, because uh, John Kelsey, I believe, just produced a paper on, on data validation requirements for NIST, uh, I, I think might be adopted by the U.S. government. Um, so for those of you selling into the government, this might be something you want to look into. Moving along into um, our second topic, uh, which is lost tapes and lost backup media. Um, I'm sure a lot of you in the room are familiar with the Bank of America incident. Basically, the tape fell off the back of the truck. Um, this, this one still makes me mad today. And I, I used to talk a lot at, at ISSA chapters around the country. And so, you know, members of ISSA usually are pretty good with security. They're practitioners day to day. An overwhelming number of the IT people that, that I would speak to at these events, they absolutely positively refuse to encrypt their backup tapes. Today, they refuse because their job is recovery. Their job is in the event of a disaster, I have to go grab that tape and get that thing restored. And I don't want to have to worry about what the key is. I don't have to worry that it's in, in encrypted. So, the, so they're, they look at their job that if, if they cannot recover and recover quickly, that they're going to get fired because they're not incentivized to have the data secure. And so this still goes on. So we, you know, so, hmm, hello. There we go. So this, the, these numbers are continuing to go up. So, so some 30 million records and 51 incidents of lost tapes, um, not encrypted. Um, we are, I am hearing about some lost tapes, but they don't really care because they are encrypted. Um, treat them like cash. I mean, it's, it's your value to your company. It's your intellectual property. You know, it, there, there are many options to, to encrypt media. I mean, and they're seamless to business operations as well. So there's drive level encryption. Most of the drive vendors are producing um, this. We have inline appliances that will go ahead and take care of some of the key management features and go ahead and encrypt. Um, some of these are even hardware accelerated so they can do very large amounts of data very quickly. You also, I mean, Traditionally, we've had the server-level software so that it plugs right in with the, with the tape and archival systems. And there are ter certain uh, hybrid variants of that um, where, the, where the SANS controller or, uh, or RAID controllers will also facilitate encryption of that media. Um, this allows you to not worry if somebody yanks one of these things out, which is supposedly a dead drive in your SCSI array, puts a new one in, throws the other one in the trash, and somebody finds it. Dumpster diving still happens. Nope. Potentially. Potentially. Um, there was a there was a talk at Black Hat about about pattern recognition and pattern matching in in binary files, and there are tools out there that, that people look at to to find within blobs of of binary data very specific things. Because actually, if you look at a binary file and you know what to look for, there are literally images or pictures that will kind of pop up, and you know what type of data it is. So then all your, cho your challenge is to find the, the beginning point of that data and the end point of that data. And I've watched, I've watched practitioners of this art pull GIF images or, or uh, binary executables out of, out of a blob of binary data because they know what they're looking for. So people who are trained in this know what they're, know what they're doing. It's it's there. There are tools that are free that are okay, and there are some for for, uh, uh, for sale variants that are very very good that will lead you through the process. So you take I wouldn't. So, besides, I mean the the, the 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 technology is becoming pretty commoditized as far as as uh, drive and and media encryption. Um, so it's not. I mean the cost really isn't that much more than than over and above the, the basic storage. Sir, so you had a question.
So the, 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 question, the question is, is, is are legacy systems incapable of adopting this type of technology? And for, for media encryption, they are absolutely, uh, uh, this is an applicable case. If you, if you notice where I've got the red circles, you may not be able to find a vendor who's going who's gonna to sell you a, a Z-series software for the mainframe to encrypt data prior to being put out to tape. But to the rest of the vendors, it's just a data stream. They don't care. It's just data coming in there encrypted. So, yes, sir, you had a question. I can't lie, performance is still an issue uh, for, for many of, of these products. And, and so I will typically see if, if it's a requirement, if it's a, it's a compliance mandate, there's some sort of data separation that goes on. Um, there, there, there is a change to the operational flow of data within the organization. But it can be done. I watched an insurance company uh, in the Midwest use Oracle to do a two-phase commit back to a mainframe database because they wanted not only different transaction processing, but they also wanted different backup routines. So it, you're right, where there's a will, there's a way, it will get done. Number three was uh, the oops, the uh, accidental disclosure. Surprisingly common too. Um, there was a case, New York Times basically had, uh, had information on a, on a story, um, leaked it, uh, they, they literally sent it to the wrong party. <laughs> um, inadvertent disclosures. Uh, I think this also comes from, uh, from attrition.org, by the way. Um, so this is in some of the, uh, uh, the database, uh, the DBLOSS database. So the number of incidents predominantly over the web. So posting information to a website. For those of you who are in here in Jeremiah's uh, discussion earlier, you will notice that the, the links that are not published but available, this is one form of inadvertent disclosure. Um, there are areas of websites where authentication or authorization are not required, and so that is a leak of, of, inf uh, of information. And today, the dominant way that the uh, number of incidents is through the web. Um, with snail mail being uh, second. However, the number of records lost, uh, still old snail mail. Medical records get mailed to the wrong address all the time. And I've seen some small hospitals shut down and fined because of this, where somebody, um, some grandma sat there and got a giant container of medical records. Um, so it happens. Accidental disclosures are just as damaging. Real losses, real fines, and so forth. Oh yeah, autocomplete is not your friend. <laughs> um, so the, the, the talk is about uh, data breaches and encryption. Now, the problem is, is that data that's on a website or data that's being sent through paper or, or, or uh, that's data in use. I mean, it's, it's gotta be viewable. And if it's encrypted, it's not viewable, it's not usable. And this is not the type of thing that you're going to unsolve with encryption. Oops. So one of the things that we recommend um, is data loss prevention technologies for two specific reasons. One, the location of sensitive information that is um, in its consumable form throughout the organization. So most of the data loss prevention technologies have um, 
They have client side agents that allow you to, to examine data as it's being used. So they have about six, seven different uh, types of technologies from regex expression uh, checks to, to find certain uh, types of sensitive information. Um, they have hash chaining, cyclical hash chaining uh, examinations of chunks of data to see if, if something's sensitive. They do uh, absolute matching. There's a whole bunch of different ways that these technologies can go and find sensitive information. And then it's only a matter of policy on what you do with that. So they can simply alert that it's being accessed and used. Or in some cases, um, if it's very sensitive information, they will automatically encrypt. This technology is available for data at rest, so it will do active scanning in some cases on servers. And it's also network-based by most of the major providers so that you can locate it and potentially encrypt it on the fly. You can create your own denial of service attack internally if you screw up the way you set it up, but it will work. So internal scanning also, uh, data discovery, um, one of the ways to help find information that could potentially be leaked throughout the organization. There are a lot of email and web security tools that are available nowadays that, that look for the outbound traffic, scan it for sensitive information uh, to help it from leaking out. Um, but still, this comes down to human error, almost every type, and there's not a lot we can do about it other than these types of scanning and discovery technologies. And then the final of the part of the talk was, was really about some of the uh, uh, the companies that have been hacked and breached, I mean, by malicious parties who are going and, and, and getting the data out of the company to, to use it for fraud. Um, Card Systems is, is really the poster child for this. They are the one who, who actually went out of business, and very quickly, by the way. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, so I'm not going to go into details on this, so I'll make sure we stay on track. Um, TJX, uh, another, yet another example. Um, and, and at this point in time, um, probably the largest set of penalties that have been, have been levied, although this is not the largest breach. I think the Royal Bank of Scotland World Pay is going to exceed this by, by far in terms of fines and, and cost to the, the company and in the number of cases of fraud. Um, and it's potentially the case with, um, with um, uh, the Heartland Payment Systems breach as well. But with TJX, 45.7 uh, million customers affected initially. Um, sales continue to rise. So part of my reason for doing the preamble on this is even to this day, uh, customers don't necessarily perceive this as an issue. The companies are not necessarily treating this as a data security problem, but a PR and relationship problem. And um, even though it didn't affect the stock price. So I've got a friend who is Dave, Dave, yeah, his name is Dr. Nicholas Imperato. He works at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. And he had done a study on mapping stock prices um, at, from, the, uh, from six months before the breach um, to as far as he could after the breach. But he also did some subjective um, uh, analysis as well. So he took some, some interviews, some, some exit polls, and so forth. And, and what he found was the companies that appeared to have a plan did not stuff, suffer any stock hit whatsoever. I mean, over a period of six months after, after the breach, they did not. It was purely a public relationship exercise. That's, that's what his study had concluded. Um, and if I can find a, a, a reference for that, I'll, I'll go ahead and get you guys the link. Or DSW, yeah, wh whichever one it is. Right. Um, they're going to go out and shop where they've always shopped. And as far as the, the, the people who are buying the stocks and everything else, I don't know that they pay that much attention to data breaches in general either. I mean, it's the security folks that say, oh my God, what are these people doing? Um, well, we, we. So if you can put a good spin on it, then you've completely, in, in the general population, you've completely eclipsed it. Well, thank you for the comment, because it kind of leads to where I want to go with all of this, that what you're in essence doing is, you know, the, the individual company may survive, but you're poisoning the entire ecosystem, uh, f f you know, because the, the credit card issuers are, are going to pay or the merchants are going to pay. Behind the scenes, somebody's going to pay for the fraud that actually does happen. 
So there might be a breach, it might be 100,000 records, and maybe they get lucky and it's purely, you know, they, they recover the data, the data doesn't get used, whatever. But in many cases, it's because this is an active breach with intent to use that data to go commit fraud somewhere else, um, it's going to get used and there are going to be hard costs. And sometimes they fall on the individual consumer, sometimes they don't. I'm finding more of an awareness. I've, I've done a couple local things within the Phoenix area to, to talk about security for, for local business chapters. and. I was actually surprised at the last two that I spoke at where uh, I want to say about 20% of the audience members had had some type of fraud where there was illegal charges on their credit card. Um, in one case, the woman uh, was sure that she had been a victim of check washing. In another case, she thinks that she had been a victim. Uh, that's a, another woman um, said that she, that she was told that somebody had taken pictures of her check and those checks were recreated. Different threat model. but. Nonetheless, I mean, so so it's entering into the minds of, of the average consumer nowadays, but we're we're still not there. Yes, sir. So, in your view, who now, what organization, which is the banks or whatever, or Visa, who has the ability to squeeze corporations to tighten up their security? So obviously, they're not doing it on their own. They're doing it on their own because effectively, the costs they bear are simply less than it would cost them. Well, technically, the PCI Council for the credit card industry is trying to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, we were having a discussion of this over lunch that uh, you know, with a uh, with an auditor that you know, in in some cases, it appears kind of arbitrary that that some organizations or and you had also brought up an example over lunch too, um, where. In one case, um, they have a very, very minor breach, and they are fined. And in another case, they have a major breach, and they're fined the exact same amount. Or in a third case, they are given an opportunity to go ahead and clean up the mess without a fine. I'm not clear on, on what, how they really gauge intent or, or what the fine's going to be or what the remediation course of actions that's required. Um, I know they put them under additional scrutiny. Um, but once again, I'm also aware of a couple of cases that have been covered up. So. Um, I mean, this is something we cover, and until, you know, on a, on a, an auditor like Ernst & Young is going in and certifying that a company's financials are good, if they're wrong, they have a fiduciary exposure here. These auditors that go into these PCI, they have no skin in this game. Um, that's true. Um, so until then, other than their company, but their company, if the company went out of business, they'd just all go get other jobs elsewhere because there are not enough QSAs out there to do the work. At this point, yes. My contention has always been, why on earth does the merchant get my credit card number? I don't want them to have it. I mean, Amazon stores mine. I don't want them to. They did it automatically. I don't have a choice in the matter, really. I think I might now, uh, over the last year or so, that they put in the ability so I can actually delete it. But there are a number of merchants out there that don't give me that opportunity. They're going to store it. They scream bloody murder, actually. Um, I, I am able to verify this through some sources. Others will deny it. Um, but many of the merchants wanted to maintain the relationship with the customer long term. They wanted the data metrics on what they were buying. They wanted to use the credit card number as a primary key because they didn't have social security number. They needed the information to help them maintain profitable business. Well, I say that, but if I go to a business and I pay cash, and I don't know if any of you read my blog or not, but I actually tried the experiment. I went back to cash last month, and it was a really weird experience, but that's, that's certainly something. I give them a $100 bill, I get my groceries back, that's it. Nobody knows what I bought. They don't have my credit card number. It can't be breached. But that's the extent of the relationship, is they simply know who I am because they see me come in every week. Well, there's that, but uh, I've never been mugged, but I've had my credit cards replaced a couple times because there have been fraudulent charges on it. Um, you know, usually the worst thing is the auto debit people. You tell me you don't want to pay anymore, you're taking your business elsewhere, they keep paying, you know, charging until you cancel the credit card. Um, but there are, there are cases with my credit card that have been uh, charges that shouldn't have been there. Um, 
couple of different cases. So to, to me, that is, I, I'm, I'm at more risk there. I have a bigger exposure there with a the credit card than I do. So even though I'm supposedly only liable for 50 bucks, I've got to go through the annoying process of getting it cleared up. And I don't do online banking. I'm probably one of the only security professionals that don't because most of the people I know actually do online banking. I don't trust it. Um, I know that my browser can be hacked nine different ways um, easily. So I just don't trust it. And the only type of shopping I do online is through eBay because I've got a little, you know, PayPal fob because I trust that. Do any of you not do online banking? I'm the only weirdo, okay. So once again, uh, how it happened, um, compromised web, injection of code within TJ Maxx, um, Cyber crimes are increasing. Uh, you know, once again, this really isn't necessarily something that encryption is going to help with unless we are encrypting the data at rest and encrypting data in transmission. We still have to protect those systems that do the processing. Um, I will get to the next one I want. There we go. So I don't even know what to say about Heartland. I mean, it, it, it you know, maybe it's only 600 records. Maybe it's. 100 million, I don't either, but we don't know. Um, so one of the reoccurring themes throughout this, this talk. Nope. So it's at least, that, that's my floor, is 600. But if they're, if they're processing 100 million through the system, that's probably my high water mark. You, you're going to expect that those credit cards got used more than once. So it's probably not that either. But the number could be anywhere in between. So what do you do with a breach of this size? Now, did I read correctly where it said that, they, that the banks and the financial institutions have to pay for replacement of, of the cards? And why isn't the entity that the issuing banks have to foot that cost? Because they're the ones that were, that were breached. That's a great question. I don't have an answer for you. But from, from my standpoint, that there is a lot that's going on here that we, we could actually help with as, as security professionals um, to learn about what's going on. I think we're getting about 30% of the useful information we could. There is a lot that we could do as security professionals if we had the other half of the picture, if we knew, if we knew what the fraud rates were. Um, you know, because th these attacks coming in through the internet um, are automated. Um, they can go against hundreds or thousands of sites. They can try the same attack over and over again. And as Jeremiah said in the previous one, I don't need all your vulnerabilities. I just need one. So, yes, sir, you had a question. Hmm. There's a couple ways I could respond to that. So th they had determined that, that information had been being siphoned out of there since 2005. So when they started to realize that there was a problem was when they noticed elevated fraud rates with a very, very high statistical probability that it was coming from TJX. So we don't know. We don't know how many. And you've got to remember, too, that the, they, yeah. So they had also, they had changed their, their, their tactic. What, what it was told was that they were, they were going into supermarkets and they were pulling cards off the shelf, taking 
taking transactional data uh, from the credit card information that was being stored both legally and illegally, putting it onto you know, a Home Depot card and going out and using it. In other ways, they were taking um, credit card transactions and buying Home Depot cards with them through fake credit cards and then, and then going ahead and using those to cash out. So there were a number of different ways that they were, they were getting money out of the system based upon this um, and in a number of different countries as well. And some of you might have gone to a grocery store recently and noticed that you can't, certain grocery stores won't allow you to buy um, the gift cards with a credit card for exactly that reason. So this was actually the original talk that we were going to give was the data security life cycle. And, but encryption fits into this quite nicely, um, that if we, if we examine information from its creation to the point in time we no longer need it or should be destroying it, um, every single one of these steps has certain security steps that we can perform. And in many of these, in the storage, the sharing, and the archival of this data, or even the destruction, encryption is an appropriate tool and an effective tool to help with this. Where we run into trouble is where the people have to actually use it. And those are the areas where we have to you know, uh, support our efforts with other types of technologies. Laptops, desktops, portable media. Um, so to just kind of wrap up this presentation, um, really I think the, disclos the disclosures that we've had have really taught us the wrong lesson or taught the market the wrong lesson. It hasn't taught the market how to secure the data. It's taught them how to react to not get penalized. Um, blame the credit card companies because they're not changing enough of the system and the ecosystem by which we use these things to secure us. So ultimately they're gonna, they're gonna you know, bear the brunt of a lot of this, but the merchants are along the way as well. Um, so sooner or later, and my guess with, with breaches like the Heartland payment system where I could probably poison the entire ecosystem, the credit card infrastructure, um, sooner or later something's gonna happen. That, it's going to happen just for fun, if nothing else. Customers do suffer from identity fraud. Retailers suffer from credit card fraud. Uh, we need complete breach disclosure. More importantly, we need complete fraud disclosure. You know, the, the, the cybersecurity threat teams do have better information. The FBI does have better information. They're not disclosing it. Destabilizes the market. That's illegal. And we should have a root cause analysis. We do have a lot of security professional out there, professionals out here, a lot of them at this conference. They're good at solving problems. Um, it, or at the very least, we should eliminate a lot of the low-hanging fruit. I mean, it shouldn't be so darn easy to, to literally get information off a disk drive, off of eBay, or a laptop in the back seat, or a backup tape that falls off. We've got technologies to do this. They're cost-effective. They work. So recommendations, encrypt your freaking laptops. <laughs> You know, media gets moved, it's gonna get lost, and uh, it lasts a really, really long time. So if even it takes a long time for somebody to find it, um, odds are eventually somebody will find it. Encryption works, I've been doing it for years. It was good then, it works now. Um, and there are a lot of qualified vendors to supply it. And if you can, reduce the storage of it. Um, there's a lot of information we don't need to collect. Um, we've been deriving value from a lot of information. I'm a database expert, I've done a lot of BI work. Um, I know it's handy to have around to look up, but if it's sensitive information, you run the risk. You run the risk of having it lost. That's right. That's right. Most of, most of the, the federal laws do have some sort of retention period. It's not necessarily specified, but it is mandated that there is a retention period. Sometimes it's self-defined, sometimes it is defined. Legal documents also. Uh, my wife's a real estate broker, so you know, we, we, I've got files and files and files in my garage that are supposed to be kept for seven years or whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I know. And as we get to electronic record storage more and more, as companies like Iron Mountain move from a physical storage to an electronic storage, um, you know, this whole concept of crypto shredding or, or, or end of life data is more important because if you don't do something about it, it lives on forever. Its half life is indefinite. So if we, unless we do something with cryptography to secure that data so we can, you know, throw it away and throw, or just throw the keys away, um, it lives forever. Now, granted, it, it, it deteriorates in value and, and it, it gets dirty by itself over time. Uh, it goes out of date, but still it's there. And a social security number has a very long lifespan too. 
I think that's it. Any questions? Little choppy, I'm sorry. It was the first time I ever delivered this particular presentation. I've basically taken one of Rich's slide decks in mind and uh, put this together, but hopefully it was uh, useful. No other questions? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>